in the last video we learned that ionic bonds were bonds that one species will transfer electrons to another species in order to get to the happiness of a noble gas. Now we're going to start talking about covalent bonds. And this is a covalent bond, this is a chemical bond in which two or more electrons are shared by the two atoms. Covalent compounds are compounds that contain only covalent bonds. We have here an example of two fluorines, and each fluorine has seven valence electrons. When fluorine comes together, because we know it's a diatomic molecule naturally, because there's less energy for it to sit as F2, look what happens. Each of those fluorines now shares one electron. So essentially, both fluorines have a full octet. So there's two ways of depicting covalent bonds, and we can either write the compound with, like we've been doing with the dots, so here on the left I have two fluorines, basically each of them sharing one electron, making them a full octet, or we can depict it as a single line. And we do that for the sake of simplicity, but we can say that the shared pair of electrons is represented by a single line just because it's easier to draw. In a covalent bond, each electron in a shared pair is attracted to both nuclei of both atoms. And this attraction is what holds these two atoms together. And it basically is responsible for the formation of these covalent bonds. One thing I want you to know is that this discussion that we're talking about covalent bonding applies only to the representative elements. And the reason for that is that these elements, the number of the valence electrons, is equal to the group number. The representative elements are the S block and the P block. All right, let's move on. Note that we have two different types of electrons when we are dealing with covalent bonds. We have those that are called bonding pairs and those that are called lone pairs. The lone pairs are the pair of valence electrons that are not involved in covalent bond formation. So for example, the fluorine that we just saw in the last slide, only two electrons actually shared in the bonding. The rest of the electrons around the fluorine, those are called lone pairs. But the, those two in the middle that actually were sharing with each other, those are called bonding pairs, because that's the one that actually makes the line to bond with the other fluorine. The structures that we use to represent covalent bonds, such as F2, which we just talked about, are called Lewis structures. A Lewis structure is basically the representation of covalent bonding in which shared electron pairs are shown either as lines or as pairs of dots between two atoms. And this is only showing valence electrons, of course. So let us consider the Lewis structure of water. We have the Lewis dot symbol for hydrogen, for both the hydrogens, and we have the Lewis dot symbol for oxygen. Oxygen has six valence electrons, so we would expect it to want to bond twice to fill its octet. It actually shares two electrons with two hydrogen molecules. So it basically forms two covalent bonds, one with each hydrogen. And you can see the representation here in the middle with the dots. And of course, hydrogen is now full, has a full octet because it has two. And oxygen essentially also has a full octet because it's sharing a total of eight electrons. And we can also show it like the picture on the right with the, bond, with the lines. That's a single covalent bond. What about double bonds? Double bonds are found in molecules like carbon dioxide. We're going to learn in a little bit how to write proper Lewis structures, but for now, I just want you to become familiar with the language associated with these bonds. So we have a double bond. A, a double bond is basically just when two atoms share two pairs of electrons. Carbon dioxide is an example of that, as I was alluding to. So carbon has four valence electrons, and each oxygen has six valence electrons. So for everybody to get its octet, carbon has to share two pairs of electrons with each oxygen. So that's why, if you see here, I'll circle around, that's the total octet for carbon, this is the total octet for oxygen. So we can either do it in the dot symbol way, or we can actually write it as the with the lines, but it's the same thing. And the triple bond is the same concept. It's an, two atoms that share three pairs of electrons. So you have a single bond, a double bond, and a triple bond. Before we start learning how to write these Lewis structures, I want to compare a little bit the properties of covalent and ionic compounds. Ionic and covalent compounds differ a great deal in their general physical properties because of the nature of their bonds. They're, one's ionic, one's covalent. 
So there are two types of attractive forces in covalent compounds. The first type is bond enthalpy, and this measures, it's a quantitative measure of the force that holds the atoms together in a molecule. And that's discussed in section 9.10 of this chapter, but we're not gonna go over that section, but that is one type of attractive force in covalent compounds. The other type is called intermolecular force. Intermolecular forces are usually quite weak compared to the forces that hold atoms together, the bond enthalpy, and that's why molecules of covalent compounds are really not held that tightly. And that's another reason why you'll notice that covalent compounds are usually gases, liquids, or low melting solids. On the other hand, when we talk about ionic compounds, those forces are a lot stronger. So ionic compounds are usually solids at room temperature and have really, really high melting points. Many ionic compounds are soluble in water, and when you put them in water, they result in conducting electricity because the compounds are really, really strong electrolytes. Most covalent compounds, on the other hand, are insoluble in water, and their aqueous solutions generally don't conduct electricity. So this is table 9.3 in your book, and it compares some general properties of sodium chloride and carbon tetrachloride. Carbon tetrachloride is a covalent compound versus, of course, salt, which is a, an ionic compound, and you can tell, just look at the differences. First of all, at room temperature, sodium chloride is a solid, and carbon tetrachloride, or carbon tet, as I'm going to call it from now on, is a liquid. The melting point, look at the melting point of the salt. It's 801 degrees Celsius. That is really hot compared to how easy it is to melt carbon tet, negative 23 degrees Celsius. It's a lot harder to make sodium chloride vaporize. Now I want to compare some bond lengths between the different types of bonds that we just learned, single, double, and triple bonds. Now we go back to covalent bonds and some properties between the different types of covalent bonds. Bond length is something that can be measured and it is defined as the distance between the two nuclei of the two atoms being bonded together. Typically, triple bonds are the least length, so they're the shortest, and single bonds are the longest lengths. And you can see here in table 9.2 that generally triple bonds are a lot shorter than single bonds if the two atoms that are being bonded together are exactly the same. For example, if you have carbon and nitrogen, which can single bond, double bond, or triple bond, you can see that the triple bond is 116, whereas the single bond is 143 picometers, by the way, that's the unit. It, of course, depends on what two atoms are bonding together. And for example, if you have something like hydrogen bonding together with hydrogen, well, those are really small atoms coming together, so that bond length is going to be smaller than a hydrogen, for example, bonding with an iodine. Iodine is a much bigger atom, so there's a bigger length between those two nuclei. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is electronegativity, and then we will get into writing Lewis structures. That'll probably be in the next video, though. But let's start talking about electronegativity. So far, we've learned that covalent bonds share electrons, whereas ionic bonds transfer electrons. So if I was to give you something like H2, two hydrogen atoms coming together, you know that each hydrogen atom has one valence electron and they're going to come together and share a pair of electrons to complete their octet. But what if I gave you something like hydrogen fluoride, H and F? Well, we know that fluorine has seven ele valence electrons and hydrogen has one. So, and this is a covalent compound, they are going to share those electrons. But the interesting thing is, is that hydrogen and the fluorine atoms do not share the bonding electrons equally, as in H2 molecule, for example. And that's because hydrogen and fluorine are not exactly the same atoms. In H2, you would expect that when they come together to share those electrons, that those electrons are spending the exact same time around each of those hydrogen nuclei, but in a hydrogen and fluorine, they don't. Those electrons spend much more time around the fluorine atom than they do around the hydrogen atom. And that's why in this electron density map, you can see that they show the fluorine is way more electron rich than the hydrogen. Hydrogen is called, you know, it's said to be electron poor because the electrons tend to spend way more time around fluorine, around the nucleus of fluorine than they do around hydrogen. So a polar covalent bond, 
or just basically you can call it a polar bond, is a covalent bond with greater electron density around one of the two atoms. And this map, this is called an electron density map, you've seen these before in different colors, but you can see here that it, there's way more electron density around fluorine than there is around hydrogen. You can think of this as unequal sharing. Fluorine is sort of a hog, sort of a bully, he, he wants them all for himself. Or you can think about it as uh, a partial transfer of electrons. We know that ionic bonds completely transfer electrons over, so if you have two you know, ionic compound coming together, one of the atoms will completely transfer their electrons over. But this guy, they do share, there is a sharing, but the sharing is unequal. So, so far we've learned of ionic compounds and we've learned of covalent compounds. But within this covalent compound, there are nonpolar covalent compounds, which is something like H2, when you have equal sharing of electrons, or polar covalent compounds, which is something like hydrogen fluoride, where there's unequal sharing of electrons. We're going to learn now how to tell, how could we tell if it's a polar covalent or a nonpolar covalent. Let's move on. A way that we can help distinguish between nonpolar and polar covalent bonds is electronegativity. This is the ability of an atom to attract toward itself the electrons in a chemical bond. Elements that have high electronegativity have a really greater tendency to attract electrons than do elements that don't have high electronegativity. So for example, hydrogen would have a really low electronegativity. As we might expect, electronegativity is related to electron affinity and ionization energy. Those are two things that you should have read about in chapter 8. Electron affinity basically means that the, the atom itself tends to pick up electrons really easily. And high ionization energy means that the atom does not lose electrons easily. So fluorine, for example, has really high electron affinity and has a really high ionization energy and has a high electronegativity. So there's a relationship there. On the other hand, sodium, for example, would have a really low electron affinity, a really low ionization energy, and a really low electronegativity. One thing I want to point out is that electronegativity is a relative concept, okay? It can only be measured when you're relating it to other atoms. Electron affinity, though, is measurable. We can measure how much energy it takes to add an electron to a certain atom, but electronegativity we can't. So we have these relative electronegativity values, and I'm going to show you that next. This is figure 9.5 of your book, and it shows the relative values of electronegativities for most of the atoms. In general, electronegativity increases from left to right across a period in the periodic table. Notice that as the metallic, metallic character of the elements decrease, the electronegativity character increases. Also note that this is a general trend. For example, transition metals don't necessarily follow these trends. Another thing to note is that fluorine is the most electronegative compound excuse me, atom that we have in the periodic table. The halogens, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur are found in the upper right hand corner and those are the most electronegative atoms that we have. Here we have three types of bonds, covalent, ionic, and polar covalent. To tell the difference between these types of bonds, all you have to do is follow this rule. An ionic bond forms when the electronegativity difference between the two atoms is two or greater. So basically atoms that have widely different electronegativity values tend to form ionic bonds like sodium chloride, cesium chloride. You can see that all of those have an electronegativity difference greater than two. Anything that is zero, zero would basically be purely covalent, which would have to be elements with comparable electronegativities. So the same amount, same relative value of electronegativity. So those would be something like an H2 or a Cl2. Then you would have your polar covalent compounds, which is not exactly ionic, but there is an un unequal sharing of electrons, and that would be anywhere between zero and two of difference between electronegativity values. We're going to do some problems like these in class and they're really simple. All you got to do is just find what the electronegativity value of one atom is and find the other and then subtract them and whatever that difference is you can decide where it falls. Alright that's it for this video. See you guys later.